off a day and welcome to Coffee with the Candidates. This series was created to educate and inform Guam's voting population on the positions candidates running for office take on some of the island's most controversial topics. In this episode, we have two senatorial hopefuls running under the Democratic ticket, Jermaine Alerta and incumbent Senator Talena Nelson. Coffee with the Candidates will continue after this. Half a day, you're watching Coffee with the Candidates. I'm Jeff Marsh, so, and to my right is Democratic Senatorial Candidate Jermaine Alerta. Why don't you say hi to everybody? Half a day, Guam. I'm Jermaine Alerta, running for Senator for the 35th Guam Legislature. Can you tell us, if you're going to be walking through the, the Fiesta line, what are we going to see on your plate? What kind of Kelleguin are you going to have on your plate? You know, Jeff, I've always been a big fan of Kelleguin. That's actually my favorite food. Uh, but I'm very partial to uh, beef Kelleguin. Oh, okay. Yeah. The chewy stuff. <laughs> oh, delicious. <laughs> okay, great. And um, how about this? When we open up your laptop uh, and we look at your Hulu account or your Netflix account, what television programs are we going to see on there? Oh, you're going to find a whole bunch of political shows. Uh, my favorite is The West Wing. It's since um, been, been, been Timeless done. Timeless classic. Yeah, it's been done for over 10 years. Um, but I also have Parks and Recreation, Madam Secretary, and uh, you'll probably see a little bit of Scandal. Okay, Scandal, of course. <laughs> yeah, so that's one of our programs, so we're, yeah. we're, we're happy about that. Okay, um, and what time of, type of music do you like? Oh, I'm eclectic when it comes to my choice of music. Uh, you'll hear me listening to uh, rock and roll, R&B. Um, I love ballads. Um, I'm a kid of the 80s, so I love all that stuff growing up. Boy bands, um, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, my absolute favorite, though, is um, like the old Motown stuff. I do like Otis Redding. He's, he's How about a little bit of OPM or Chamorro music? Chamorro music is, is there. I wish I, I knew how to translate all the words, but um, I love singing along with Chamorro music just because, you know, it, um, it kind of invites everyone to join along with the Chamorro music and it just makes a very homey atmosphere when you hear Chamorro music. And singing Chamorro music also just allows you to relax. A bit right. Better. I think when my kids are homesick from Mama's house, they definitely put on the Chamorro music. It always <laughs> surprises me. Um, they're usually cranking Power 98. <laughs> yeah. There you go. So let's get down to business here. Uh, we'd like to know a little bit about your politics. Uh, what will be your first legislative initiative if you're elected? So I've always been a big advocate of um, cutting government spending. And I, and I believe one of the ways to cut government spending is to cut the size of government. So one of my first bills I'd introduce, if afforded the opportunity to serve in the legislature, is I'm going to introduce a bill to eliminate the de deputy director positions from all Gov Guam agencies. All the deputy directors? Yes. Okay. That is considered a patronage job. Do you think it'll cost you votes? Well, okay, so let me, let me just clarify first. There are some deputy um, positions in like the public safety agencies and also some of our health agencies and in our education agencies. Those ones I wouldn't touch, but I would go down the line with every other agency because these are politically appointed positions and the de director and the deputy director for s agencies or similar positions are right now appointed positions by the administration. And you hit the nail right on the head. Political patronage jobs, we don't, always get the people most qualified for the job. We don't always get people who are familiar with the agency they're being tasked to help lead. And I think that has to stop. If we're gonna need someone to help the director or the administrator or the head of the department or agency, it should be someone who has knowledge, institutional knowledge of the agency that they're representing. And you're okay if that costs you votes? I'm, if it's good for the government, the, if it costs votes, that is not, uh, something that I worry about. Okay. What's one, two, or three, I'm going to leave it up to you, bad decisions you feel like senators in the last legislature or the current legislature have made? Well, um, in, the 30, in the 33rd Guam legislature, so let me, go, let me go back a little bit. In the 32nd Guam legislature, uh, they, they passed a, uh, a pay raise bill, and um, that gave a lot of elected officials, um, you know, crazy higher higher wages um, in the tune of like twenty thirty thousand dollars more than the, what they were making uh, that's one thing that I that I really did not like and I was very vocal 
in my opposition to that. In the 33rd Guam legislature, uh, the legislature failed to uh, repeal that, th those pay raises. And I think that's one of the biggest failures. It was a very hot button issue during that election. I think it cost some of the senators who didn't support a repeal of those raises um, their, their seats in the legislature. So that, that has to be one of the main ones. And then in the most current legislature, I believe passing the bill to, um, to raise the, the taxes. Yeah. Especially the sales tax? Yeah, well the sales tax, which hasn't been implemented yet, but, but I know there's efforts to try to repeal it, but just the fact that we're raising taxes in, uh, you know, in a climate right now, in an environment where our people are, are, are hurting financially, our government's hurting financially, but we're passing the burden by these tax increases to our people. And, and, and you know, our people deserve better than that. They deserve better representation, and they, they deserve people in elected positions, they're, they're island leaders, that have to stand with them and fight for them so that, so that things aren't hard. Things get a little bit easier for them. I'm not going to say they're going to get, they're they're going to they're going to wipe away all the problems that we have as a community, but we we as the government need to make things easier for our people. Perhaps another thing um, that could be on your agenda is making sure that uh, uh, taxation um, is is doable, that the resources are in place for uh, the Department of Revenue and Taxation. To collect? Yeah, you know, there's, there's, um, when I, when I was working in the legislature, the 32nd Guam legislature, um, the committee that I was, uh, the committee that the senator that I was working for, Senator Mike Saint Nicholas, he had oversight of Department of Revenue and Taxation, and I know through some of our research and our little investigations, asking questions, we did find out that there was about a hundred million or more in uncollected business privilege taxes that were out there, and the, the sad thing about that was. We, we weren't collecting the taxes that were supposed to be owed to the government, but yet businesses who weren't paying those taxes were still being allowed to operate. There was really no penalty for businesses who weren't keeping current with their taxes. They were allowed to continue operating, allowed to continue renewing their licenses, and allowed to go on as business as usual. If we as the government aren't doing our job in collecting what's being owed, we really never know how much our government needs or how much our government has in terms of uh, money. And it's important to, to um, give the Department of Revenue and Taxation, which is the, the agency that's supposed to go out and collect those taxes, we have to give them the resources. We did give them the resources. They just weren't able to hire additional tax collectors to help ease the burden on the, uh, the strained workers, the workers who are straining right now being spread very thin um, in there now and not being able to collect those taxes. So we do need to arm them with um, the resources and the manpower to go out there and get the money that's owed to the government. Okay, we just have a handful of minutes real quick. I want to ask you because you mentioned Senator Michael San Nicholas. He's been a real firebrand, you know. He's been mm -hmm. somebody who's been controversial and not worried about taking hard stands, even if it cost him politically. Uh, so far, it seems like he's been buttressed and he's been elected and re-elected. Um, tell us who inspires you, either as a local senator or a politician. You know, it's, it's, I, I, thought, I thought about this. I've, I've always thought about this because I have worked for many senators over the years, both Republicans and Democrats. Um, senator John Kanata, Lieutenant Governor Mike Cruz when he was a senator, Senator Mana Silva Tyron and Senator Mike San Nicholas. And it's very easy for me to say that I relate to them because of the personal re relationship we were able to uh, create by virtue of me working for them. And my bias towards them would, would definitely show. But I've, there's one politician who I've always admired. I've never worked for her, but um, former Senator uh, Joanne Brown. Uh, the reason why I admire her is because every time she presented herself or spoke on one side of an issue or on the side of an issue that she felt strongly about, she was always very passionate about it. You could see the passion. She was very eloquent. She was very articulate. And most of all, when she spoke and when she was done speaking, you felt that there, it was very genuine. Even up till now, even if I don't maybe agree with her on everything, even when she speaks in public, even when I meet her, you know, just, just, just outside and a passing conversation, you still feel that what she says is genuine. And I believe our elected officials need to be that. They need to be genuine so that people can feel a sense of calm with them. People can feel that they can trust them. People can feel that they're relatable. And our elected officials need to do that. And Senator Joanne Brown was always, although she's a Republican and I'm a Democrat, she was always one of those um, who, who was very influential in, um, 
you know, my interest in, in the government. I think you hit the nail on the head when you said that she's persuasive because even if you don't agree with what she's saying, she does persuade you that mm -hmm. she, like you said, is articulate, she knows her facts, and she has an opinion that's based on facts. And she's not afraid to stand up for what she believes in, even if it's gonna create um, friction. She, she will go toe to toe with anyone and present what she believes is right. And like I said, even if you disagree with her, you can always respect her when she speaks to you. Okay, we're watching Coffee with the Candidates. I'm Jeff Marshall, show with PNC. We'll be back right after the break. Welcome back to Coffee with the Candidates. I'm Jeff Marsh so To my right is Democratic Senatorial, I won't say hopeful because she's already in the local Senate. She's running again, Senator Talina Nelson. Would you like to say hello? Uh, buenas and half a day, Guam. Okay, great. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Okay. I know you told me that uh, you're a little bit nervous, even though you're on camera every single day. So I'm going to break the ice. If you're walking through uh, a fiesta and you just come off the serving line, what kind of keleguin are we going to see on your plate? Uh, guihan. What kind? Guihan. Oh, and guihan. banado. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Fish and, and deer. I know that you. <laughs> Talina, I know that you don't get a lot of free time because if you are not in session, if you're not in hearing, if you're not in a resolution presentation or you're not uh, touring some site, um, you're studying. But when you do get a little free time, what do you like to do? How do you like to spend it? Um, I like to spend it in the outdoors, uh, go to the beach, go spearfishing, um, just spending it with my family. Okay. Do you yeah. find that all of the physical... Oh, and traveling. traveling. I like to travel, yeah, my free time. You did a fair share of that when you were in the military. Yes, I do, yes. And do you feel like your military experience also contributed to your love of the great outdoors? No, I, it was the way I was raised. Yeah. Always that way? Always that way. Okay. Um, if you had your druthers coming up in the 35th legislature and there was one agency that you could trim the fat on and say, stop spending so much money, what agency would that be and why? Hmm. Well, that's a good question because right now we're going through the budgetary process and there are um, a lot of things coming into the light about the agencies as we put a microscope on how their spending is, is done. So I think that as soon as we are done with this process, um, I could answer that question because really we're seeing a lot of movement of money that is questionable, special funds being um, appropriated back into the general fund. And so the question is, is if you're moving the special funds around, if your billing process is not accurate and you're not pushing an efficient billing process, then, then why are we still um, uh, advocating for so much money for these agencies to have? So I think we need to wait a little bit to see the answers of some of the agency heads and to really um, start to dissect and, and look at these agencies um, once we get all the information that we need. I think it's a little bit premature right now to say exactly where I would want to want to advocate to cut the fat. Was it surprising to you to learn, for example, that special funds were taken out of Chamorro Land Trust and not returned, and that it crippled the land trust from doing its day-to-day -day work, which is surveying for infrastructure as well as land lots for potential leases that have been backlogged for over 20 years? Yes. Um, it was very surprising. Um, however, we've been putting forth that question since the beginning of the term, uh, and, and especially the way the special funds are, are being uh, moved around. So uh, what the real issue is, is how do we hold these people accountable, right? Are we just going to say, okay, it was done, let's move forward. But no, there needs to be some kind of accountability for this, these kinds of actions. Because it, essentially, it's the people's money, no? Right. On the spectrum of liberalism, where do you consider yourself? Center, left? I'm very conservative. Very conservative? Yes. So centrist. So would you say that you're pro-choice or are you um, pro-life? Hmm. Well, um, for me, I believe that life is sacred and uh, I believe in the sanctity of life and um, 
you know, uh, we must, I feel that I must do what I can to, to protect the sanct sanctity of life from, from natural birth to natural death, uh, to take care of those that are in the womb and to also take care of those, our, our elders who, who, are, um, who are facing ailments and struggles. That's, that's how we were raised in our culture. And uh, I respect life. Well, are there extenuating circumstances in which abortion is okay? It's a tough one, I know. It is very tough, yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. We'll, 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 we'll let it um, present itself as it does, depending on the circumstances. Given the recent allegations of government corruption and mismanagement among high-ranking officials, how would you address the accusations uh, and what would you do in regard to the person accused? Uh, there have been some very fiery accusations as recent as yesterday, uh, going back the last uh, couple of weeks with the Chamorro Land Trust and uh, as recent as yesterday with the hospital. Mm -hmm. What's the question? How would you handle an accusation? And if material is presented as evidence yes. or the person who's testifying seems like they're reputable and they have the information necessary, how would you go about making sure that that situation is rectified mm -hmm. with regard to the corruption in the accusation? Well, um, you know, the investigation is always always necessary and, and it's good that a lot of these things are, bringing, are being brought into the light because if they're not brought into the light then we cannot address the issue. Um, really we need to dissect and understand what level of corruption is it, right? Um, how far has this gone and how long, ha and how long has this been going on? And, um, and to see what laws did they actually break? And of course, I, I believe in the judicial process that if they did do things that are illegal, that, um, that they will be brought before the courts. Um, there will be a consequence for that action. But of, of course, no, we, need, we cannot just turn a blind eye to a lot of, a lot of these um, questionable actions. We need to do a proper investigation and, and if need be, hold those accountable for it. I can tell that you're a, a very thoughtful, considerate, and sensitive person and that you want to answer carefully. I'm going to ask you a question. It's not a loaded question. Yes, I'm, I'm white, okay? But it always <laughs> is a loaded question. <laughs> no, actually, um, I just want you to know that I don't have any skin in this game, okay? Because I'm an observer, I'm a reporter, I can see both sides of the issue. Do you believe that non-Chamorros, and I know that there's a legal definition of non-Chamorros because it goes right back to the Organic Act. If I had been here and I had even been born uh, prior to 1950, I'd be legally Chamorro. But do you mm -hmm. believe that non-Chamorros should be allowed to vote in any plebiscite that decides the political future of Guam? The political future of Guam really goes historically back to the many years that we've had to, the people of Guam, <clears throat> had our ancestors had to endure a hegemonic government and suffer under that, that government, whether it would be um, the change of their culture, their cultural identity, um, the impacts of their economy, um, the abandonment of, of a superior force just to realize that, you know, this, this place was, was something of value. Um, so I, I believe that the Chamorros, the, I believe that the way it is set up that, yes, um, it is a question of equity and not a, a matter of equality. So if you do not uh, meet the requirements that is stated, then I don't feel that you should have a right to vote in, in the political status of Guam. Okay, when you say you, you, uh, you that, that's just rhetorical, right? <laughs> well, I, oh, yeah, no, of course not. Yeah, and of course, I wasn't even born on Guam myself. Um, how will you ensure better management of government funds so that Guam does not repeat a threat of a government shutdown and layoffs? It seems like that's always looming. Well, um, right now we're, we are uh, pushing uh, all the agencies uh, to start explaining every cent, every cent and dollar spent. And um, what we're doing is with the zero based budget uh, formula, we're, we're telling them that they need to account for it and they need to explain why it is important to them. Uh, but also we need to look at what uh, areas of the governments we can streamline, you know? because uh, we've been operating this way for 10, 10, 20 years, 30 years. And so no, there definitely has to be change with, with the way we do things, the efficiency, uh, even down to the technology that we have within our system. So we, 
those are the things that we need to look at rather than just saying we're going to tax the people more. If the legislature winds up with a majority of Republicans, mm -hmm. how are you going to bridge the divide? Mm -hmm. How are you going to be able to negotiate and coalition with those who might have some different interests than yours and you can dovetail uh, those interests into common progress? No, I don't think that's an issue. I don't think party is an issue in, in when, when you're in the legislature because really everyone in that body has it was, wanted to be a senator for to help the community, to help the people of Guam. And I think that when we focus on that, then that the party is not an issue. And for me, it has not been an issue. Uh, for ha perhaps we differ in some, some areas, but when it comes down to it, we want to see our community grow. We want to help our island. So you're comfortable with negotiating oh, yeah. with the other side across the aisle? It's not even about negotiations. It's everyone is on the same, they have the same heart, they have the same mission in mind. No matter how passionate the argumentation oh, gets. Oh yeah, you know, <laughs> there's always, you know, a common ground that we can find to move forward. Senator Talena Nelson, it's been a pleasure to have you in our studio. Thanks so much for spending some time with us. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. You're watching Coffee with the Candidates. I'm Jeff Marsh's show with PNC News. Thanks for joining us.